So first, remember that our schedule changed. The uh, new version is on the website. And remember that we changed Wednesday and Thursday, and the whole trip will happen on Thursday. Okay? So if you had a poster for Thursday, remember it's tomorrow. And uh, we started selling our cachaças. We have two types, and this is the price. We accept uh, cash, but please remember that we don't have any change, so be kind to us and bring the, the correct amount. And uh, for Brazilians, we accept pics, okay? And we have a QR code here in the office if you give. And uh, you will receive a form to fulfill for the goal if you arrive in your email service. So this is the announcement. Okay. So just uh, remembering that this is the last lecture for Fernando and he's leaving us tomorrow. So enjoy this time with him. particular sucrose in qubits that is made for using uh, for the past like five years at least or more, uh, which has emerged as a very good one. There's of course a lot of game states. And that's kind of a very interesting, just uh, uh, round, just a, like a playground for, for coming up with new ideas, because kind of you have a toolbox that you can combine in many, many different ways, and it's very unclear, you know, what is the space for innovation there. So I think, you know, that it's very possible that there's a much better sucrose in qubit that hasn't been found yet, right? So that's uh, so I will for like five slides follow actually some lecture notes from, from Deborah, he's one of the founders of Supercurrency Qubits and when I when I watch a bit like them so I'll just you know reproduce in a much worse way of course for you. Uh, because it's better than anything I can write myself. So so the time being I'm just going to plagiarize Deborah, but I, because I'm saying that it's not right, hopefully you won't sue me. Uh, so so uh, I want to start with like some analogy between you know, uh, atoms that we have in nature, where right? of course there's many different types of atoms, and, and that's great because you can find atoms with the right properties for the kind of kind of you know, computation or information process that you want to do. And I want to argue that the same thing is true. We want to start thinking about circuits that we print, right, by you know, uh, lithography on, on on some substrates, uh, and and have and put the right properties there. So the hydrogen atoms, right, just have a nuclear, nucleus and electron going around the nucleus. Uh, the analog here will be, we just have, you know, uh, we have, maybe, let me go back. You, you have like some electron condensates, right, inside. And then of course you have some boundary, which usually is positively charged, right, to keep this electron condensate inside. And, uh, you know, the electron moves here around. Here you have uh, this, shapes that you just built, really, like, uh, physically. So you have two shapes like that, we all know, right, this leads to a capacitor, right, of the charge there. If you just put some kind of spiral here, this leads to an inductor, right, for this electron condensate that is there. And then, you know, this unique electron now is really a whole condensate of, of electrons. Uh, and we make it super conducting because we don't want to have resistance, but as little resistance as possible. So it's actually a condensate of Cooper pairs, right? So they form you know, the pair up, that super conductivity, right? Uh, and here, you know, the velocity of the electric tells you how fast it goes around. Here will be the current through the inductor, right? It's kind of telling you how fast this condensate is kind of moving here. 
and the force in the length will be like the voltage that you apply across the capacitor here, right? Which is a lot of way to control, you know, these condensates. Um, so it's so very interesting, right? That I'll define a qubit. So by the way, it's a qubit on a microscopic. Uh, it's kind of you call microscopic qubit if you want, right? Because it's really not on the same as one particle. It's a qubit defined on where you have like um, you know uh, billions of Cooper uh, pairs here, right? In this condensate. So it's a collective degree of freedom to use. Uh, so, so how we can see this right LC circuit as a quantum harmonic oscillator? I mentioned that before, why you have this LC again. There's some inductance going through, there's some capacitance, there's some charge that accumulates here, there is some currents, and therefore there is kind of a flux, right, associated to the inductor. And if you quantize, they become conjugate variables as position and moment, uh, right, this becomes the flux and the charge. Uh, and you solve is a harmonic oscillator, right? So now once you solve the harmonic oscillator, and you put the constants in the right way, you see that the frequency of oscillations is given by you know, h bar over square root of L times C, right? The inductance and the capacitance. Uh, and that will be important because you know, uh, we will see that this frequency is usually uh, is always in supermassive cubes in the microwave range. And, and being in the microwave range is you know, very helpful once we want to control the right, Um So uh, let me show this. Um, um, now, why, why is it not a qubit yet, right? which I already mentioned to you as well? Uh, it's because these this levels are equally spaced, right? So, so the idea now is to put a control line that gets very close to the qubits and either send a microwave uh, signal there at the right frequency, for example, omega LC, or send a flux control, right, to change kind of the energy levels and try to solve these first two levels. But if you send a, a microwave drive at this, at this frequency, Great, it couples the soup, but it couples all these other ones as well. And that's a mess, right? We don't want that. And that's exactly what we don't have in atoms, right? In atoms, we have this very interesting right energy level, and it's not uniform in space, and that's why we can address them usually very well, right? With, with lasers. So we want something similar here. And the way to do it is to introduce another element, right? This we don't really learn at school, right? But it's not that like that. Oh let me I I, I didn't mention one thing, which is this, right? This is also interesting to, to understand. So this omega, once you put the parameters that we did in the lab for the inductors and the capacitance, is from like 10 to 5 gigahertz, right? So, so microwave. Uh, and the temperature is, as I mentioned, like 10 kelvin to 20 kelvin, right? So we are in a regime, right, where, you know, this is much larger than, than this, right? So it's a very cold system, right? So if you just let the system cool, uh, uh, equilibrate, it goes very much to the ground state, right? Which is something that we want uh, for reset, right? Um, so here, right, you have like our, you know, uh, super relative qubits, in this case, this, okay, this LC oscillator for all, uh, and that's how we think about controlling it. There's a control line that brings a microwave system, and we just couple back a capacitor again, right, this circuit. And this gives a way to control the system. So how, how we make this now a better qubits, right? Uh, we, we replace the uh, inductor by a non-linear inductor, right, and it is cool that it exists, right, so it doesn't have to, but it does, and some of our Nobel Prize for this, Josephson, uh, Josephson, a long time ago. So the idea, uh, what he found, is that if you take two superconducting islands, like here, and then simply by a very thin insulator, uh, uh, a few, I don't know, one nanometer side here in the picture, uh, then you do get something like an LC circuit, right, similar to what we saw before, with a capacitance uh, and with an inductor, but the inductor is non linear. If you look at the current, right, you just integrate, okay, uh, you integrate, uh, there's the current and integrate the, the voltage to get the flux, uh, you see that it, it, it's kind of like an inductor that you expect because it's linear, right? Uh, it, it, it's very small, right? Like, uh, you know, flux is linear, but actually it is a sign if you go at theta times. So it's really like periodic. And uh, that's interesting if you go to the energy, right? you get a cosine of the phase, right? So there's a phase difference between these two islands, and the potential there is a cosine of this phase difference, instead of just the phase difference as a normal inductor. Uh, so once we, so, so you know, like that, now you can sort of start to play around with this. You have three basic blocks, right? You have a capacitance, you have a capacitor, a inductor, and a just for junction, right? And you can start combining this, right? The same way that we combine electric circuits in, in school, right? And we could compute all kinds of problems about this. 
we can do this in this case as well. I can try to compute the quantum properties and see you know, what's kind of the energy spectrum, what is the dispersion, everything. Right? Um, so, so um, you know, let, let's just write the Hamiltonian. There's a very sim simple way to combine them in parallel. That could be another one, right? So you have the capacitor, you have your just for junction, uh, and you have uh, the inductor, real inductor. You can also put a flux right in this loop if you want. You don't have to, but you want. And as I mentioned, the conjugate variables are number of Cooper pairs and phase of, you know, phase difference of the Cooper pairs right in the, in the just for junction. Uh, and then the Hamiltonian, right? It's it's something you know like uh, there is this which is like a kinetic term, right? Similar to the kinetic term of the hydrogen atom. Then there is the potential, right? The potential now is this cosine, right? It comes from the just for junction energy. Uh, and you have a quadratic, really quadratic, which comes right from the real inductor. It's a quadratic potential. And you see, right? If you at very small uh, phase difference, uh, it behaves just as an inductor, right? The cosine becomes a square. But at higher values, it deviates, and and that's what we want to use, right? So, in that way, we can get like an interesting, you know, energy spectrum that uh, that allows us to define a few bits. So um, now, you know, is this uh, thing about the lab, right? We can start playing with the value of LJ, right, versus L, and of e, so the you know the capacitors of the just conjunction versus the cap capacitors of the real. Uh, sorry, the, the, the inductors of the just projection divided by the inductors of the real inductor, and the same thing, the, you know, the energy of the just projection divided by the energy of the capacitor here. Uh, and you know, it, it can be from zero, which means right, that there is no, um, you know, there is no just projection. Uh, is that right? Yeah, so, so very large value. And people have, have been doing that for a long time, right? And, and they find all kinds of theories. It all started with the flux qubits, which was this one. It didn't have very good properties, right? The trans one is the best one uh, people think, right? There is also functional, which will be here, which is a container for the trans one. And there's other ones which they were worse in the end and they will be abandoned to six, right? So, and I'll explain later why the functional seems to be a good one. But what I want to show you is this kind of plot, which is very interesting, uh, which is in log scale. The coherence time, right? So the coherence time. Uh, it's just the time that it takes for one error to appear in a qubit if you store right in a, uh, in a store at state there. Uh, and this is like with time, you know, so, so supercomputing qubits, they started just before the 2000s, right, so they'd be around for 25 years maybe. And it was very, very, you know, this is the microsecond, right, so they were like the nanosecond, they were like 10 nanoseconds in coherence time. And that's not very good, right, because the gate takes nanoseconds itself, so it was just terrible error. And then you know, it grew very quickly, right? Started with the charge qubits, it went to the flux, right? And then the at some point, you know, emerged and was way better, right? And it kept going, you put the trans one in a, inside a three dimensional gap, so you can get very good numbers around like you know, a millisecond. And this didn't continue, also because, you know, unfortunately, this exponential growth didn't continue as well, of coherence. What did, what did happen after this, and I'll mention, people build systems with a larger number of, of trans ones. And now a two-dimensional transform today can reach kind of millisecond level, right? There's experiments of that as well. Uh, you know, uh, I think it would be necessary for humans to grow even more, but that's this kind of fast, you know, very kind of exponential, right? This more law for uh, for trend for supercomputing gives it did stop, and now it's being harder to, to make progress. But you see, right, that it, it did grow, uh, it did advance very fast. Um, okay. So let me go, let me just mention, and it was asked last time, uh, okay, you have all these supercomputing qubits, how you couple them, right? And you couple them, it's very easy, you know, you have, a, for example, a LC circuit here, IOC circuit circuit here, you can put a capacitance between them, it's just this uh, direct coupling, in terms of qubits, gives this kind of bilinear coupling, right, which is exactly what you want to exchange, you know, uh, interaction between them, excitations. Or you can put the inductor, right, which also leads to another kind of bilinear interaction. So it becomes particularly simple to couple them. This is just a plot from a paper from MIT with Oliver Group. There is two transforms. They have this X form, they, they call X form sometimes. And instead of just a capacitor, they actually put a knot of transform to couple them, right? Uh, so that's just for you. And, and you see the scale of things, right? So the skills are very large, right, if you compare to after. Uh, they are like 100, you know, this is like 100 micro, micrometers, right? So it's like you know, a tenth of a uh, millimeter. <coughs> so you, really, you pretty much can see naked eyes, right? And you have this QVC here, right? Uh, so they're large. 
Uh, and why they are, oh, so before this, let me just mention, okay, so, so what are we fighting against, right? We are fighting against the coherence, right? We make superconducting, we make it extremely close, but there's still a lot of noise, right? And what is this noise? There is two ways that the qubits respond to noise. One is like a uh, relaxation time or a relaxation rate, and this is the rate or the time that the system will lose an excitation in the one state, right? So the system will just lose energy. The qubit will just lose energy to the environments, and we decay from one to zero, right? So this is not a poly channel, right? This is a, it's called m to bendy channel. Uh, we, we can approximate by a poly channel, but it's not, it's not quite one. Anyway, this happens because there's spontaneous emission. You have, of course, the electric losses in all the materials that you have there. You have quite fire totality, right, in the superconducting islands. You have like topics that flux lines they use. And you have this, and this is like the, this is where the frontier is in material science for superconducting qubits. Uh, this is called two level system, right? It's a lot named for qubits. But it's a mysterious qubits that happen in the material due to imperfection in the material. And they just couple to your qubits and interact with it. And it's very hard to predict the distribution, and it's hard to predict, you know, like kind of why they're there. But they're definitely there. If it's on resonance, the qubit is just dead sometimes, right? Because you know, all the information is there. If it's off resonance, it still leads to some kind of uh, coherence loss. Uh, so it appears more here if it's off resonance. Uh, but this is kind of, you know, if, if one can pro uh, progress in materials and improve the density of TLS, for example, that's the way forward for better qubits. Uh, yes. Uh, my, my question is, uh, because I remember when I was in experimental physics class, we saw that we could emulate uh, like a spring on a mass oscillating with a uh, LC circuit, uh, and then you can emulate harder and harder uh, systems, just increasing your electronic circuits, and even studying like chaotic dynamics with them. Uh, now that you have a way to control the levels of the, the systems, could you stop instead of like building logic gates, just emulate some systems and study them with the superconducting qubits? Uh, uh, sure, yeah, so, so there is, um, so, so it's called like quantum simulations, right? So, so in quantum simulations, you you get a system that you can create in the lab, it can be, a super, it can be like an array of superconducting qubits, it could also be, you know, cold atoms, it's very established, I track, they have done that, uh, remember atoms recently, and then you engineer a new economy, which is kind of, you know, based on the interactions that you have, right? So, so for example, you know, like super in qubits, it's very natural, the most hardware model, it really emerges just from the knowing the axis of change. And they can run interesting simulation experiments, and, and people have done this. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely something you can do. Uh, any other question? Okay. Uh, but but there is something else, right? So there is energy loss. There is also the phase. You prepare base. This is like a zero, right? This is really the zero that we love before, right? You prepare zero plus one, but you have to zero minus one. And this comes due to, for example, fluctuations in the energy levels, right? So they, they, the energy gap can fluctuate, right? Because of charge noise. That usually, this is the reason why the trend was so good. That I explain the next slide because it really mitigated charge noise, which was very, very uh, a big problem for flux qubits. Uh, you can have flux noise. You can have critical current noise, quite fire as well, and so on. You also have uh, heating by right, like heating uh, 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 noise sources, uh, right? Because in this environment is cold, but it's not zero temperature, so sometimes uh, the uh, qubit get energy from the environment and goes to excited states. They can lead to leakage, right? That was mentioned before, they can lead just to zero minus one. Uh, that's important, but that's actually set also by two one. Is right, the, uh, the air, the the average time for having a heating event is T1 times the thermal population. Thermal population, we want it to be small, usually it's like 1% or less. So this is definitely, you know, it's an issue, but usually it's much less than, than the coherence of this guy. Um, okay, so transmitters, right? Why, you know, in all of this kind of parameters that I didn't really explain what it, you know, what it means changing the parameters, but I explained it a bit now for transmitters. Why it emerge as a, a choice that many people like? And many groups start building, right? So first, there is two ways to trend that I want to mention. So, so here is the picture of two trends. This is from like how lab in Princeton. Uh, this is from uh, Google, I think. Uh, first, there is like called fixed frequency trend. So you just have your just conjunction and in parallel a capacitor, and it's a very big capacitor, right? So in the picture, that's why you have this huge capacitor. You cannot even see the just conjunction. You know? So here, you just have this huge capacitor. Here, the huge capacitor is an X. 
And if you just zoom to this small region, white one, the just injection is here. Okay? So why is there a big capacitor? Uh, I'll explain here. Uh, basically, you know, flattens the uh, how the the energy right uh, get varies with flux. Sorry, with the number of uh, with the number of particles right of, of, of Cooper pairs in the condensates, and therefore you don't have charge noise when there was a big problem before. Uh, now, if you build a transform like this, just one just for junction with uh, this capacitor, right? I mentioned before, the frequency will be one over square root of capacitor times, right? Uh, EJ, EJ times C. So that's called a fixed frequency transform, right? You cannot change the fixed uh, the frequency of the transform. Maybe by this convenience, they can change the frequency of the transform. So there's a way of doing that. You create this kind of transform, where now you replace one just for junction by two just for junctions in parallel. And then what you can do here, you can put a flux. Uh, so you need the flux control now, and then if you put flux here, this will change, you know, the the frequency of the cubes. So this is a fixed frequency. Uh, this is a double. Uh, it's a total transform. It's called. Uh, and here just means by this, this control post that you send to control the cubes. Uh, now, wh wh why why a transform? So here I'm plotting EJ, right? Uh, the basically the just for energy uh, divided by EC, the energy of the capacitor uh, for several values. From small, 1, to medium, 5, to 10, up to 50. And you see, when they are the same, you know, it oscillates abruptly, right? Uh, when you change here, N, NG is the number of Cooper pairs, right, uh, that you have kind of in, you know, in this condensate, right? Uh, I mean, there's a mean field, of course, right, which is a large number, and then this is just the quantum, right, the quantum variable. Uh, then, you know, when you increase this data, you see that it flattens, right, this energy mix. And then what happens is that you know, when there's fluctuations, right, if you're in this routine, right, and there's fluctuations in energy, it's okay, right? Your, en you know, your energy spacing doesn't change, right? And because it doesn't change, uh, remember, changing energy levels leads to the phasing, right, that I mentioned before. So then there is much less phasing here, right? So, so the trend will really solve uh, the phasing that was a very big problem in, in the first attempts of supervalency qubits. And it's just because of the simple reason, you know, that a larger ratio of EJ over EC leads to this kind of you know, flattening of the energy levels with the number, right, with this energy, uh, which is, sorry, this is actually, this is actually the mean field, right, this is the mean field number of, uh, you know, Cooper pair set. Uh, so, and then if you do that, so that's the region that we want to so right, we need a very large capacitor, right, for that. We want EC uh, to be large, so we want EC uh, to, uh, let me see, EC should be a small number, so the capacitor should be large, right, like this, uh, that's the same that we want to be in. Uh, so this is just a plot just showing that once you do this trick, and we hope, you know, people do the job, the, the best job they can, can have beauty and transform, uh, this is just the kind of plot that you get. This is, you know, how it decays uh, as a function of time, right? This, you can infer C1 from this kind of plot. It's just like some Ramsey, Ramsey experiments that people do. And, you know, many groups are measuring around uh, Oh, this, sorry, this is the wrong plot, right? this should be, this is not very impressive, it's like one microsecond, forget about this. Uh, this should have been like a one millisecond plot, plot which is the scale of the art. So this plot, you can ignore it. Uh, okay, so any question before I move on with this, or why, why the trend was important? Is this, right, the trend has way less flux noise because of this flattening, right, of, of the energy gaps with change of energy, which is this like mean, you know, prepared uh, uh, number right here in the common sense. Uh, okay, so what is the trend for state of the art, right? So what, what is the best we can do today? Uh, so first, uh, the frequency, right, is usually from 3 to 8 gigahertz. Uh, and this we can do the way you want, and when you change the frequency, the properties change, right? So, uh, so you have to find the right one for your experiments. Uh, what is the nonlinearity, right? So that's also an important one, right? How, how nonlinear or how oscillated it is, right? So the first energy level is kind of like, you know, on a gigahertz range. The, the second to third is also a gigahertz range. It's pretty much, I wouldn't say that before, but it's like 200 megahertz less, right? It varies from, you know, 200 to 400 megahertz less. So they are weakly nonlinear, right? It's, a, it's not a very nonlinear system. And that's why, you know, leakage is not something that you can completely ignore, right? Which was a question that we had before. So, uh, it's part of the, you know, it's part of the game to handle leakage. Now, the important thing is energy relaxation, right? So this is really like, a, you know, 
Some people like to talk, experimentally supposed to, they like to talk in terms of a quality spectrum, right, which is the frequency times uh, C1. And that's because usually C1 increases when the frequency decreases, right? So the preferred have this, this number. 7 million is 3 roots. I like, as a theory, not to think about C1. So if I trust, transfer this to C1, it's like, you know, around a millisecond, right? Which both IBM has shown, groups in China have shown as well, right? Like a transmog of 1 millisecond uh, lifetime. If you think about it, the first supercomputing cubes, they had around, you know, a few uh, nanosecond lifetime, right? That's a huge increase, right? It's like, you know, almost a million fold increase, so it, which is quite remarkable. Uh, how about uh, the coherence T2, uh, right? Like uh, the phasing rate, right? Uh, that's around like 250 microsecond, which is also pretty good. Okay, great. Now, but then maybe say, well, um, let's think about, you know, error rates, right? Because the error rates is what we care about the ends. If you want to think about error correction, or if you want to compare with other platforms. So, uh, readouts, right? When you want to read out the cubes, what is the infidelity that you can get and how long it takes? Uh, if the, the infidelity is around 1%, this is definitely something that I think long term will have to be improved for things to be, you know, for overheads to be better, uh, for it's around this. And it's also the slowest right now, you know, so to measure it takes 200 nanoseconds, many times it's slower, but that's kind of state of the art. Uh, how about to reset the cubit, right? To prepare again the zero state after you have done some computation. It's similar, so you know, the, the reset is actually, you know, high density, 0.2%, but it takes also a similar time, 150 nanoseconds, many times more. So if you think about error pressure, right? You have to measure the ancilla, you have to reset the ancilla. This whole process will take at least like, you know, 350 nanoseconds. In many experiments, it takes like a microsecond. So it's definitely the slowest part is to measure and reset the ancilla. Gates are much faster, as you see here. One thing is gates, if you get zero point one percent, that's great, right? Uh, and actually, there's there's a big by a Chinese group that they get zero point zero one percent, even better. So this is not so updated. And the time is twenty five nanoseconds. They can be even faster, like ten nanoseconds. Uh, two cubic gates, they are zero point five percent, right? Uh, so I did now can actually demonstrate zero point one percent, but kind of a cubic in isolation, right? Once you have many cubits together. That's state of the art, 0.5%. And they are very fast, right? They are like you know, 35 nanoseconds. So think about the surface code cycle. You have like four synodes. They are quite extremely fast, right? They are by like 140 nanoseconds. Uh, and then you have kind of this measure of the ancilla, you know, which takes right a uh, longer time, at least double long, longer time. So all this kind of data keeps that hiding in there. And that's the problem we have right now, right? So we're going to things. You should really think about a way of doing readout faster, right? That would be good. And of course, you can compensate for that just having what longer C1, right? Because if the C1 is longer, I think error is small. And, and finally, you know, people have done square edits where there's four neighbors to each qubit that can talk to, right? That's, I'll show that. Uh, any question? Yes. Uh, this data is from a. a, a, a uh, an average between various processors, or it's from one specific processor, like where does data come from? Right? Yeah, no question. It's a bit of a, this is the best in each category by itself. So, you know, uh, the measure comes from one paper where they optimize the measure, the gate comes from a separate group, a different group, and a different project where they optimize the gate, and so on. It's a very good question. Integration, how you can do everything together. <laughs> and I can tell you what you are this. So, so, this is true, integrated in around like 50 qubits. Uh, like Google experiment, for example, this as well. Uh, this is worse, this is like 300 nanoseconds. There's seven things around that. That's worse, integrates like 2%, and this takes like 500 nanoseconds. Uh, uh, integrated, this is way worse. Integrated, I mean, can get actually like 300 microseconds around that. So, so you know, I would say that integration is giving a hit mostly to the time and the fidelity of the So that's a second part. Okay. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Okay. Um, and finally, because, you know, uh, if we have time, we, uh, we might use that later. Uh, another interesting thing that you can do, which people love, of course, in atomic physics, is to do chem right? So, so usually, you know, the Nobel Prize, right, you know, Tomarosh, 
right? And it's very popular uh, topic where they have an atom and it interacts with a chemistry, right? That would be inside the chemistry. And then you have like the lights interacting with matter, and you can have a strong company where they interact in a very quantum mechanical way, right? And you have all kinds of interesting things. You can do the same thing here with the microwave range, right? Uh, not in the optical range, uh, as with atoms. Just by putting your, your, your trend, for example, you cap capacity couple it to a truly LC oscillator, right? Where you don't have the just a junction, you just have really an inductor and a capacitor. And this is a way of doing that. You have your trend on here, and you have like a strip line chemistry, right? Microwave strip line chemistry. You couple them by a capacitor. And if you do kind of, you know, dispersive coupling, right, which is a way of coupling them when the detune is there's like a bit a bit detuning between the two frequencies, you get kind of dispersive interaction. Where, where basically condition the number, right? This is like number operator of, of you know your transform. So condition on how many uh, you know how many excitations that you have in your transform, you apply a Z matrix to sorry, depending on how many this this uh, number operator for the chemistry modes. So this counts how many photons, microwave photons you have there, then you apply you know, a Z matrix to your transform. And chi is this first coming. So uh, uh, right, and then what this happens is that for each level that we had before in the channel, now you have all these levels, right? These stress levels, and this spacing is based on this type from the interaction. Uh, I'm just you know, showing this because we come back later. Okay, so that's that's what I want to tell you about transforms, you know, the basis of transforms. <coughs> of course, there's a lot to tell, and there's very interesting work on other supergravity theories, right? Fluxonium is a specific case that has been very, leads to very good kind of gates. I'll just do some questions. Uh, but all the time, there's new ideas on you know, supervising theories as well, so I think it's an interesting research direction. Uh, any question on what I said so far before I move on up to surface mode? Back to surface mode. You talk about uh, the relaxation time. One of the factors is the coupling to other two level systems. Uh, and that's created in the process of making the, the the circuit as a whole, right? Which part of the fabrication process has more impact on yeah. creating two level systems on the room? I mean, uh, this I don't know because FAB is something that's been like 20 processes in, in the FAB to do this, and I, I'm not an expert, but, uh, but most of TLS they sit on the surfaces of your qubits, or, or actually the surfaces of your just conversion. So improving the surfaces is the problem, you know, is the way to get less TLS, less TLS density. How can you improve the surface? I think it's more material problem, you know, than, than maybe a fabrication problem. It's about kind of, you know, which, for example, tantalum. Tantalum, uh, if you replace aluminum, aluminum uh, you do get better C1, because you have less TLS, for example. So, so you know, it's more new materials, or even new ways of, usually TLS like an effect in the surface of the material. So, some people say, oh, maybe you can, uh, you know, uh, grade the material, and then if there is some defects, right, in the lens, then you can put it, you know, correct somehow, like putting some, you know, some other atoms there. So there's ideas like this. So it's a, it's a problem in material science. I won't say more because I don't know more. So it's okay. Okay. Good. So how about surface code, right? So we go back to surface code. You know, we like to do the surface code of this is 20, but then we like to do like, you know. I don't know 6,000 of them, right, to factor. We are very, we are very far from that, unfortunately. But we start to see progress in experimental approach, <coughs> which is exciting. Now, if you remember, right, if you were, if you pay attention to this, you should be a bit worried, right, about doing surface code, right, because maybe this number, right, so what's, uh, do, does anyone remember what was the threshold for the surface code that I made? Let's see your memory. Zero point seven. Seven. Yeah, seven. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Of course, this was in this idealized error model, right, where everything uh, has an error with the same properties. Here, as you see, right, it's very different. But it's still, you know, kind of there's a lot to keep the very important. So the zero point five percent, you know, people sometimes celebrate saying, "Oh, we are below the threshold for error correction," and they are correct. But very close to the threshold, right? So, you know, it's very hard to see again in error correction are obvious. We really like to improve this by like five x, you know, to be like zero point one percent. This is where we have to be. This is where we have some nice plots, right, to increase when increase the distance. Nonetheless, people have done this experiment. Yes. Even one percent. The one percent. Oh, one percent. Right. So 
great question. This, we know the zero was one percent. Actually, this is where having asymmetric error model is important because you are way more in a linear to read out error, error section, error correction. This because you can repeat the measure many times by repeating the stuff like this. So actually 1% is fine. This is below threshold if all the other stuff are good enough. Uh, of course, we like to do, right? But you know, it's, it's not as critical as both IDB errors. IDB errors are very important because this takes a long time. And gates, we need some. Especially to cubic gates, they are super important, right? Because they touch two cubic as well. Uh, so there's two locations for errors. Uh, but people are doing experiments, right? They just build a surface code, right? Of the distance that they can build. They hope for the best. This is what they get, right? We are not in this regime where it would make sense to scale up more and more. They have to improve the components. Uh, but they're interesting experiments. The group of Andreas Moro and ETH, they did a distance free experiment two years ago, uh, where they just, you know, they just benchmark uh, what would be the logical probability of error per round of stabilizers, and they got like 3%, right? Which it is what it is, right? So, you know, it's uh, there, there's a very a milestone, a milestone is all. It's called break even. Break even is when your logical probability of error is less than the physical probability of error. There is many ways of defining that. Uh, this paper didn't quite reach break even, but it was an interesting paper. Then IBM has done a few, uh, I think like two papers. They cannot do surface code IBM because they don't have a spread analysis. Because of the way they use fixed frequency transmit, right? whereas Google uses uh, Turbo and you know, uh, Riga is Turbo uh, and others, we use Turbo as well. Uh, and, and they get very good coherence. They get very good C1 again. They have the records. They get like millisecond integrated, they get like 300 microseconds, which is great. The price they pay so far is that they have like this worst connectivity. Each one is connected with just two or three qubits. As a result, they cannot do service code. So there is other codes you can do, like having hex code, is a, is a version of like of Maple Sharp codes, the terminal codes. But, but the threshold is very, very bad. It's like 10x worse than the service code. So, you know, they have an experiment, but it's just, right? Uh, the joke that these are all right now, you know, like uh, error enhancement experiments, right? Because they are just, you know, gets worse. But, which is a cool name, right, for nature. So, like, a, a quantum error enhancement, it gets accepted. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's still useful to see where we are, right? The, the, the paper which is got closer, which is the one by Google that I want to discuss now, uh, does show a little bit of improvement, right? That you have to be a bit careful, but uh, it does show that we're getting there right from where we want to be. So, so the chip that they use is very similar to the uh, supremacy chip. This is just a supremacy chip, right? Singapore, but it's very similar for the air privacy experiments. And they just have transients of this X type, right? Uh, and there is kind of transients coupling each transmitter as well, which is this coupler. That's an idea which turns to be very useful because in that way we can mitigate the question we have that there's a lot of crosstalk usually in the systems. If you have a trend that you just use as kind of an on-off for the interaction, right? Of course you need more trend, you need, not, you need more control lines, it's not so good for you know, scaling up, but then you get way more accurate gates and you get way less crosstalk. So that's the scheme that is used, right? But instead of just like connecting two, there's four, right? There will be another couple here, another couple here, another couple here. And then you have this chip of around like between 50 and 60, right? Whatever version I forget where it is, something like this. So that's that's kind of the chip, right? It's very much the setting of the surface code that I mentioned before. You have data qubits, you have uh, magic qubits, which is this ancillary qubits, they call magic qubits. There's qubits in the layers that we don't use. And then they did two things. First, they characterize the error rates, single qubit error rates, two qubit error rates for control Z, measurement error rates. And what is called like you know dynamic decoupling ID uh, rates, uh, and then they ran a surface code of this is free on many patches, right? So this is one patch. You can have any other patch, but there's many ways to find a sub uh of surface code. And they ran one distance five surface code that they put this big one here, and then they compare the performance. Right. So first you see everything integrated, right? The 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 average, or maybe this is the mean. This might be the mean. One qubit error rate is like, you know, a little bit more, maybe two times 10 to the minus three, so it's nice, right? You see this mean control, uh, the mean uh, two qubit gates is this one here. This is maybe one, two, three, four, five times 10 to the minus three, right? 0.5% that I mentioned before. So really doesn't determine to achieve that. Uh, measurement, you see, is around like 2%, right? So it's worse. And then the company is also kind of bad, right? It's around 
even a little bit more. And why? Well, just because results in measurement are very slow. And Google, by, you know, you have, you have, there's always trade-offs. The T1 of Google device is not very good. It's like, you know, 20 microseconds, 30 microseconds. So there's a lot of hiding error here. Uh, now, what they could show? They, they could show something in the right direction, right? So, so here is the line of the logical properties of the error. E3 is the logical properties of error for distance 3. And E5 is logical properties of error for distance 5. And this one, they are the same, right? So below here is error enhancement, right? You increase the distance from 3 to 5, and it's just worse. And all these points you know, are average and individual points of distance 3 when they choose different subnets, when they choose different decodings. So you know they choose minimal and perfect matching, but they also choose more optimized decoding based on tensor networks and so on. And then you know, usually just worse, but they got one point, right? Uh, or a few points using this tensor network decoding, where distance five boy was slightly better than distance three, right? For the error for our risk per rounds, right? Per rounds of measurement of satellites. And then they said, oh, victory, right? So this you see error correcting work a little bit, and it's true, and it's great, right? So that's very exciting. It's the first time that this is done. Uh, what are some caveats of this experiment? The first is because well, they are not below threshold, right? So this is really a finite size effect. And they do even acknowledge that, that they, are, uh, they know that as well. If you go to distance seven, uh, it will get worse again. Worse than distance three, again, right? So this is really, you know, it's the right direction, but it's nowhere you want to be in. We have to improve these error rates, right? Some of them are lost. The other thing is that the decoder they have used to do that is not scalable, right? So, you know, the test network decoder, they're great, but they, they're possible. Uh, so there's two cameras. But it's still a very impressive experiment, right? Uh, and this, oh, let me just mention, they also do the repetition codes, right? They just, you know, do a slate and they run a class for repetition codes. But then it's a beautiful improvement, right? If you have a logical error per cycle, it decreases very nicely, right? In the whole distance, they went up to 25. And they found an interesting surprise, which is at some point there is positive rates that hit your supercomputer and cubes, excite all trends at the same time, and you know, it's a mess. And, and the insight is that it really limits the performance, you know, at this level, like 8 to minus 6, roughly. So really, positive rates is something that everyone would have to think of. Moving forward, it's not great to be so. Any question on this? All right. So now I will. I have um, half an hour, right? Yeah, about. Yeah. So, so so now, what is? Let's see if I have. Uh, yeah, let me change the presentation for a second. So now, I want to talk about some work we are doing at Amazon. Uh, I want to talk about two different kinds of work we are doing, but I will just talk about one, right? And the motivation is again, you know, uh, the overheads, right? Which is so messy. I don't know what this is said. Box. No. So let me show you this slide again now. Why is it the green one? The green one. Right. What do they mean? Ah, sorry. Thanks. Because of the presentation, what is one, but it's fine. Uh, so I just need to put my phone for that. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to this, right? Which was just making the point of this massive kind of overhead that we have, right? Even if we are at like 10 to the minus 3 error rates, right? Then we just, I just show you the state of the art experiments, they're even like five times bigger than that, right? We can have transmogs at that rate for to be the and that's great, but not kind of integrated in, right? So there's really a chance that we have to scale up the number of transmogs, we know we have to, right? It's the question before. 
right? We cannot stop at distance five. We have to go way further. We need many logic theories. That's one challenge. We need many bridges for that. We have to connect these bridges, right? We have to microwave kind of waveguides between different you know, chips. So there's all kinds of engineering challenges for that. Right now, the control line is kind of like, you know, it costs, I think, $30,000 per cube of control line. So if you pick up all your hell many cubes, you know, it's like $3 billion. You know, it's, it's like $30 billion just for the wires, right? So there's no way, right, it's going to work. So why technology has to improve? So there's a lot of engineering challenges. Uh, but, you know, like, uh, you should, maybe you should not be satisfied just to serve the scope, right? Because the overhead is just very messy. Uh, so, so the question is, is there a way of doing error correction in a more, you know, in a better way or in a more efficient way using the surface code? And this is called like a, a hardware efficient error correction sometimes. Uh, many other people work on that. People at Yale, right, uh, like Chopin, Deborah, this kind of peer user supervision theories. They have very interesting experiments uh, copying transmodes of cavities and trying to get hardware efficiency. Uh, and, and people in China and, and people in, in France. Uh, but we start investigating that as well. And one interesting uh, way of doing that is to explore this idea of a bias noise, right? Uh, so before I, I was mentioning this simplified error model where X errors, they happen the same probability as Z errors, right? Uh, but suppose that was not the case. You know, suppose there was noise bias in the sense that uh, Z errors, they were way more likely than X errors, and they were also Y errors, right? Then how could you explore that for having less overheads? You could do the following, uh, right? So if you have no bias, you read the surface code, because I explained to you, right? So we have these two dimensions, because we have correct X and, X and Y, X and Z errors, right? But now if you have like, you know, to, to correct way more Z errors than X errors, you can make this direction, right, which corrects X errors bigger than the other one, which corrects Z errors, right? So you can make like a rectangular surface code. And you know, the, the aspect ratio of this mess will depend on the bias, right? In one extreme case, when you have, you know, when you when when do not have to correct for any X error in the codes, because you know, for whatever reason you have no X errors, right? I have to explain why not, but suppose, then a repetition code will be enough, right? So then you go back to you know, classical error correction, right? So, uh, so, so, you know, the question is, can we engineer some type of bias in your system, in your supercrossing qubits? Uh, that will allow you to have just this kind of rectangular surface code and then gain this overhead, right? So that's what we and other people are trying to explore. And what is something that you gain? You do gain, of course, using less qubits, right? Per logical qubits. But you gain even more, and it's very substantial, that just the repetition code as I mentioned has a much larger bias uh, threshold than the surface code, right? This should be 0.7, sorry. The surface code is 0.7, the repetition code is 3%. So if you're here or somewhere here, you do, you know, uh, the, from the logical problems, the error just drops faster, right? With, with you know, your physical error rates below threshold. I mean, for the same physical problems, the error, but the threshold is just not large. So it's like a double game. But of course, this always kind of moves if you do not have a bias noise, right? Uh, but, but is the bias noise enough? Suppose, you know, suppose your noise is biased, uh, you have mostly kind of, uh, on your qubits, you have, uh, C noise, and you have a little bit of X noise. That's fine. But now suppose you apply C not gates, right? And suppose your C not gate application is such that an error, an X error, they have, a Z error that happens during the gates gets transferred into an X error. Then you'll do it, right? Because you only had uh, Z errors before, but now because you have these gates, they, you also have X errors at the same rate you have, right? So, so the key idea is that you need what's called a bias preserved implementation of your gates, right? Your gates should not transform X errors into Z errors. And that's not easy to do to do, but the kind of recent insights that some people have is that you can do that, and that's the way forward that I, that I want to do. Uh, so to do that, you cannot just use a trend, you have to use something more, and, and what we use is exactly this coupling of a transform with a capacity mode, right? It's kind of a, you know, a circuit QET, some people call it. Uh, and, and use the, you know, uh, the harmonic oscillator now is just really a harmonic oscillator that's easily in many levels, and we choose some states using many of these energy levels, right? So we use, you know, we put the information not only in qubits, but in higher dimensions. And the, and the hope is that if you're doing the right way, this leads to good error waxing properties, right? Uh, so there was a theory proposal for the idea they were trying to implement, but we are healing and collaborators in 2014. They proposed the following. 
Let's define the computational basis. Uh, now, biocubits lives really in the chemistry mode, right? For example, this microwave chemistry mode that we engineered that we constructed. And the trend was only used, you know, to, uh, to make the interactions on these qubits, right? But not in any active way. Uh, so now you have the qubits. And as 0 and 1, we choose two coherent states coherent state alpha and coherent state minus alpha. What is the coherent state? That's the formula. I don't know if you can see that it's right. It's just uh, the coherent state is a, cl is a classically looking state uh, which has uh, you know, a, a well defined phase, right? And has, in this case, has a mean photon number alpha squared, right? So alpha is kind of the same as it appears here. Uh, and uh, right, it, it kind of has Poisson distribution, right? Which is a, a classical distribution of photons, right? So it's, it's the class is the most classical state of light that we have, right? In quantum mechanics. So it's a very classical state, and you know, when alpha grows, it, the mean photon number is alpha squared. So it becomes a state with more photons, becomes more and more classical. Uh, uh, so this kind of so it's kind of a classical loop state. So how you could with all of this? But the way you do is that you choose two coherent states of the same kind of amplitude alpha, but of opposite phases, plus and minus. Uh, so you have a phase space, right? Like uh, P and Q, for example, that you can look for some continuous variable. This will be like two blocks here, right? In phase space. Uh, and this when alpha rolls, they become further and further away. Uh, now, what I can show is, suppose you take a dissipative process, right, as uh, Nadja is telling us, right, uh, how, how we can think, uh, build a mathematical framework for them before, uh, they have as a jump operator, this guy here, uh, A squared, where A is the annihilation operator of your photon, uh, minus alpha squared, which is just a constant, right, then, you know, uh, I claim that uh, there will be a main fold of stabilized states of dark states, right? So this dissipation will bring everything to some stabilized main fold of dark states, which is spanned by these two, you know, uh, zero and one. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, there's one catch, right? That's uh, why why it's, it's just approximate this, right? Because you know this guy is not really a formula, right? So alpha is not a formula to minus alpha, but they are also formal. So you can show that they overlap. Is exponentially small is e to the minus two alpha squared, right? So when alpha grows, they become very, very profound. And if you want to be, uh, you know, precise, you can define it cubic the computational basis plus and minus. And these guys are real formal, as you can check. Uh, uh, now, uh, why, why this works? Because you know we have we have this relation, right? So a applied to plus, so you have like a uh, photon loss and uh, annihilation operator applied to plus gives minus. And apply to minus this plus. So if you apply this twice, right, just this back the same states, right? Um, and, and but but the proportionality constant here is exactly alpha in each case. So against alpha square, minus alpha square, this brings this dark state many points. Um, okay. Uh, now uh, then what do you do? Suppose you engineer this dissipation, okay? I claim that if you engineer this dissipation in a way that I have to tell you how it is. But on the hardware level, and uh, and if I hold the information in these coherent states as my you know, computational basis, then this will suppress uh, bit flip. Bit flip errors will be much less likely than bit flip errors, and the suppression will be exponentially small in the size of alpha squared, right? And how many excitations you have in your kind of qubits. So there is now a law that you can play, which is alpha squared, that plays the that plays the role of the distance of the codes in the bigger alpha squared. The less, the more protection you have to be free. Uh, there's a price to pay, and the price to pay is that phase flip increases, right? Because you have photon enhancement. So once you have, sorry, boson enhancement. So once you have more bosons there in the system, right? There is, you know, like a, uh, basically there is, uh, you know, like a, uh, a high probability, right, of, of having a, a phase error there. Uh, but this only is linearly. So, so you know, phase. Uh, bit flip that exponentially suppress, phase flip they only linearly enhanced. So you have an exponential bias once you increase alpha square. I yes. didn't know. So, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Um, I have a question. Yes, the, uh, just uh, to know how, how much you can, uh, how much large and how much small can be this alpha? Because you said if it's 
sliding off this overlap is almost zero. Yeah. But it also happens that if it's large, the effect of optimal losses is also increases exponentially and the usually the the, the coherence and the moment you have more modes they keep more faster too. Yeah. And if you have like small uh, alpha, small photons, small number of photons, there, there are interesting things that happens too because then you have usually less uh, uh, correlation between what you are looking, but this case like more uh, slow. So I don't know if you can comment about this. Yeah, so so it's a good question. So it's, there's this free spot right for, for alpha square. And that's exactly because you know uh, 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 phase flip errors they increase linearly with alpha square or mean photon number. So if the mean photon number is too big, you have so much phase flip errors, then you are above the threshold and then there's no local for exit, right? So and then in practice in our experiment, for example, we use alpha square around two. This is what the sweet spot. So, so you know, it's not it's not like huge exits, but it's already not related to the bigger problem by these two guys. And this is enough for having some pretty good, as I will show, uh, suppression of uh, of bit to bit errors. Uh, but but I could see maybe going to four, but it would never be like ten or more. But this is already like too many bit to bit errors. Uh, and, and why this became a very interesting idea. So this was interesting, but you know, it was there and people didn't know what to do with that. Then there was two papers, more recent papers, theory papers, where they proposed ways of doing a bias preserving synods using this kind of, this called two component caps, right? There's many kinds of cat codes, uh, you know, using harmonic oscillators, uh, oscillator states in one information. This is one of them. And, and they show a bias preserving synods realization of this, you know, uh, uh, of these two component caps. And then people got excited. Uh, so I'll just jump that for a time. Uh, how can we do you know the two photon dissipation, right? So I, I have to show you how to implement that. That's basically the rates of this coupling of this dissipation. So right, so we have a dissipation that happens uh, uh, a large fraction of dissipation on the carries mode. So of course photon loss, right? This happens at rate A. Now I need to show you a way where you can engineer a two photon dissipation, right? Where photons get lost in pairs, right? And and this is you can do you have to get this constant by two mode squeezy. There's some uh, two mode drive, right? That you can also you know engineer. Uh, so the way to do that, again, we have to use our right two bits of you know uh, of our, our Lego set, right? And that's one way that people propose that actually works in practice. We get something similar to a transform. So these are our cat units. Why this is our harmonic oscillator. Uh, and this is a gadget that's called ATS, asymmetric <coughs> friendly space. You know, if you just had this guy, this will be a trend, right? But then we also have a real inductor now, and we have another just conjunction. And we put two flux lines that we control. And then we write a Hamiltonian, we see everything. And if we choose everything the right way, we can make this Hamiltonian, we can engineer this Hamiltonian, uh, where the B modes. Is just you know uh, is just the uh, annihilation operator for the excitations here in the ACS, and the A mode is the annihilation operator for the chemistry modes. So we can make what is called a three wave mixing condition, where one excitation of you know the this kind of down mode, this buffer modes, uh, exchanged by two excitations of the chemistry modes. Right. And now what we do, we just make this chemistry mode very lossy. We just couple the transmission line. So then, you know, you exchange two photons of your character mode by one excitation here in this ACS, but this B mode very quickly decays. This is exactly this kind of two photon dissipation that we want. Right. And, 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 you know, for getting my alpha square, you just engineer this guy. Uh, so, right, so we create this Hamiltonian just using the nonlinear, so the just conjunction, right, which allows us to create nonlinear process, for example, free rate mixing. Uh, and we engineer, we just you know, couple this to a lossy mode, uh, right? So it's just uh, normal loss on the B mode. This will lead to this interaction that we want. What's the strength? The strength is like you no know, four, right? You can do it just by activation theory, for example, or effective theory. It's like four, if you two squared, you say this coupling that you get, and kappa B is the strength of the of the rates of the K of the B mode. So this was proposed and was done in a paper by a French group. Well, they did see a very nice increase of between error rates. Uh, and then, you know, we start investigating that, right? So, so just going back, we have cat 
theorems, right? I show you how to generate dissipation using superconducting theorems, right? Uh, and the nice thing is that you have this bias model. So the probability of x errors uh, goes across the kappa one, which is the photon loss rate, that makes sense. Uh, but is the exponential suppressed in alpha square, and the probability of z errors is only linear increase in alpha square. So you have this very big bias. Right. How much time have? This is plan. Okay, we'll, we'll be at the uh, so, so, you know, now we have a different way of doing our question, right? Then we can see how it compares to this kind of all trend of the approach that I showed you before. Uh, so, actually, uh, yeah, I lost the update that I had, but that's on my. But I'll just say words because it's interesting, right? So, so what was up? Once we found out about this, we, we wrote a theory paper where we did was the following. We took this kind of cover model simulation, right? That would be 160 of uh, 320,000 qubits, something like this, right? With surface codes. And we said, suppose we have cat qubits with biased result gates, uh, but kind of a similar, you know, kind of error rates, right? As you can get in the transform case. What would be the overhead reduction? And we found it could be substantial. We like, you know, more than 10x, right? So, so that will pay off to do it. But we also found a catch, which is, uh, as I will show you next, it's hard to get good gates with this cat tube, so you require a very strong kind of coherence time of the ordinary following that. And that was a motivation for us to start doing this experimental work that will tell you. But let me just tell you how they compare, right? So starting from the trend that I saw before, we can get good T1 and T2 times, like 30 microseconds to 60 microseconds. The X and Z error rates, they are comparable, but there is no bias. So we just use a two-dimensional surface code for that. How about if you have, you know, uh, cat qubits? Uh, then we can use either a repetition cat code, where the cat code corrects X errors, and the repetition code corrects Z errors. Or if you want more X protection, we can use this like thin surface code, right? Rectangular surface code. Uh, so cat qubits are nice because there's a built-in protection to X errors, but it's hardware efficiency, right? We try to correct errors on the hardware level as much as we can. They can have very long T1 times, uh, especially if you use three-dimensional cases, where it's hard to scale, after like very many seconds. And some good fix to type similar to trend. And of course, the error rates are much higher than X error rates, that's the bias, right? Uh, uh, a drawback is how to get good gates, right? And this will be the problem that I want to address. Uh, so this is idea of bias is on gates, right? So if you don't have them, this scheme will not work. Gates have to be fast, high dense, and bias preserved, right? Uh, which means you do not map X error into Z error. Sorry, Z error into X error. Uh, so there's a way of doing, you know, a very easy X gate, which is bias preserved. You just rotate your phase space, right? Going from alpha to minus alpha in time. Okay, you can any continuous way that you want. And you can check that, right, this implement an X gates, and that, you know, any error there, uh, will be any kind of uh, Z phase error will be fine, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, it's a very robust process, right? Kind of some, uh, not the whole process, but it's a holonomy, right, in phase space. Uh, oh, oh, so this is a paper that I made, sorry, so it was there. So we did analyze this, it was the first paper that we wrote at Amazon, right, a bunch of us. And we did, we did find, right, so this picture comes from the analysis in our and that's why it's a rectangular surface code. We did find a good thing about this scheme, which is there's a 10x reduction in overheads. If you use the same error rates for two cubic gates, for example, for simulating the Hubbard model, which was the application that we looked for. But there was also bad news. There was a very long coherence time, right, there's like 20 milliseconds, which is a lot, to achieve this kind of like 0.1% cubic error rates, right? So, so because these bias preserving gates are kind of hard to implement, you know, you need very high constraints on your hardware and then maybe it's not very realistic. Right? But it's still we can investigate it. Uh, so you know, suppose you want to do a cat cat, right? A C not gate, which is bias preserving. What these guys proposed below the mirror hindi was was something which is a little bit complicated. So basically, you know, you have a dissipator on the control, which is just a normal dissipator, and you have a dissipator on the targets, which rotates, right, as the X gates 
but only kind of if the control is in the minus alpha state, right? It does not mean it's in alpha states. That's how it approximates uh, you know, uh, this, part, this process. It does what's called compensating Hamiltonian to improve as a basic error, so don't worry about this. But if you put, do all the calculations, you do find that the infidelity, the error rate, is kind of the square root of kappa 1, the photon loss, over kappa 2, the engineered to photon loss. And that's the big problem, right? Because the square root is useful. So you need very big uh, kappa 2 or very, very small kappa 1 to get anything reasonable, right? So, so in our paper, for example, we got that we needed for 0, like 60 milliseconds to anyone going for 60 milliseconds lifetime to be, you know, to have substantial savings over surface code. So that, that was not very encouraging, right? Uh, but, you know, so bias noise can lead to more harm than the one where I that's great. But cat qubits are deliberately engineered to have large noise bias, which is good, and has promising experimental demonstration. But cat, cat, and tangy gates, if it's bias deserving, they are not practical, right? They require high coherence, strong dissipation, completely engineered. So, so you know, we need a better idea. And the idea that we found, that we did an experiment on, was to go halfway through. So we, we do use, you know, we want to do a repetition cat codes experiments to build a large of qubits. But uh, our data qubits, they are cat qubits, the simple cat qubits. But our silver qubits, they are transforms, right? So, so you know, it's halfway. And that's nice because, you know, we can just use this normal dispersive coupling that I mentioned before, which is very common in quantum optics, right? And also in, in, in uh, cat security, to do a similar case, right? This is just do the CX gates. If the control, right, we you just need the set gates where the control is very similar. Uh, so, so this just does the job for you. And now we don't have this kind of adiabatic errors, and this gate can perform well. And the gate that is just you know, photon loss over chi, which is the dispersive copy here. So I'm running out of time, so I will change that. Uh, we do need to have some bias reserve. We do need to use high volume of the, of the transforms to get a bias for the gates. So you might use G F in quality of the channel. Uh, and then we need some high match, you know, maybe two kinds of E F the same, such that you have a, 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 a decay here, it doesn't spoil the computation. I'll jump in the details. Uh, because I want to summarize. Uh, so this is the chip that we have that we have in the lab. Uh, right, this is the repetition codes. Uh, and there's many components, right? So there's a unit set that repeats. So we have a storage. The storage is where the cat qubit lives. In this case, it was the distance five uh, code. Now we have built, we have built distance seven code as well. Uh, so this is where the qubits live, the data qubits. Uh, then this buffer, right, is just to engineer this two for participation. So kind of X correction is done just by these buffers, right? It is also called kind of passive error correction, right, or autonomous error correction, but you don't need to measure anything. The, the dissipation does it for you. Then you have your transform, which are the oscillas. This zero transform is just for characterizing. So you have one oscilla here, one oscilla here, for the repetition gap codes. Uh, and we have couplers, total couplers, because we found that one, there was also the same thing as Google, very useful, right, for switching interaction on and off, and you know, making everything work as it should. So this is the chip, right, that we built. So actually, you know, these very long things here are the cat qubits. Uh, this we built with Tantalon, and building Tantalon was very important for high coherence. And we do like three chips, we have two chips, one just for the Tantalon, the other for the aluminum, which is the rest of the process. Uh, this, is, it, this is like the capacity of one of the transform, the JG is a very small, right, and you know, we put everything together. Uh, our, you know, T1 of both the transform and the storage has been improving with time. Around now, we can get you know, T1 of transforms around kind of uh, 50 microseconds, which is, which is good, but you can be better, but it's good. But the storage is a two-dimensional chemistry, and that was very important to scale up, right? Three-dimensional chemistry is very hard to do. And then we can get around like uh, 80 microseconds, which was, you know, total uh, led to these improvements. This was the aluminum before, it was like three microseconds from the French experiment, right? So doing aluminum was for sure, doing total was for sure. What we have done, we, have, uh, we haven't done the full experiment yet, let me just do this claim, you know, that's where we are. But we have done the CPAC correction, right, the X correction, on many uh, cats at the same time. And we do get, you know, when we use alpha square, we, we do get up to kind of like, you know, 20 milliseconds, or even like up to second for some of them, second lifetime, so a very big improvement from X error rates. 
The sweet spot that we use is around two, as I mentioned, right? Uh, we have upright our CX gates, uh, and we have shown when alpha squared is two, we get a bias, which is true, right? So we get PX, which is for 10 to the minus three, so very small uh, X error right here. We do we get the, uh, a PC, which is worse than for transfers, right? Which is expected because why we have this trade off is 1.5%. A way to compare this error rate with the error rate of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a symmetric qubits is like a geometric mean, right? Because this kind of tells you about these aspect ratios in the surface one. So we do get kind of you know, some geometric mean, which is complexity, right? Zero of the alpha chain, like zero point three point eight percent. And that's it. We were excited about this result because before cat uh, gates on cat qubits, they were just way worse, right? They were like, uh, you know, ten percent sometimes, like way worse. So they started to get like compare with transports, right? If you compare in the right way, which I think is exciting. Uh, where we are, so, uh, okay, so transport seal architecture, right? Which I show you, which is something that we found trying to build this thing in the lab, is much better than cat cat architecture. Okay, so I didn't mention, but you know, the threshold is 20 times higher. So that's really, if you want to use cat, we really think that transport seal is the way to go. That's one conclusion that we have. Uh, we have done experimental progress towards building a module qubits, which we think can have break even using these repetition cap codes. So far, we have implemented CX gates, which has a bias of 50, right? So, so uh, bias result is working there, and has a very small PZ properties with larger, sorry, should be PX, PX properties. We have done simultaneous X dissipation up to, you know, from milliseconds to second, depending on the conditions. Uh, and the remaining check, uh, category we write out is getting various checks to work. Actually, this, we are almost there. And getting them to work in parallel. There we are having some problem with frequency targeting, right? Doing stuff work at the same time. Uh, but you know, we, we keep trying and we hope to get there. So I think you know this, if you can achieve that, I feel good this kind of get on, on roughly the same level of progress from, of, of what trainers have done. And the question is, which one is the most promising? And honestly, you know, with all this work, we don't know, right? So there is, that's where I said that it's very early times, it's very hard to pick, you know, a, a winning strategy. But I think it's also exciting because it means that it pays off to experiment, right? And to build different things and see how they compare. And that's one thing that we have been doing uh, to compare. There's another way of having efficiency, it's called dual rail. We have the dual rail qubits, which is two transports, so it's simple than this. I had, oh, sorry. Finish the talk. Great, my presentation. Uh, uh, sorry for that. We should call dual rail qubit. We had a paper recently, and which I'm pretty excited about. Maybe it's even better than gas. I suspect not. But also, more investigation is needed, right? So, so you know, it's a pretty exciting time to be doing supervised qubits. There's a lot going on. There's many people doing it. And, and I hope we do start getting more progress towards error correction, which is what we need. So, just to finalize, you know. Uh, what happened? Ah, okay. Let me say a few motivational words for you, you know, because I feel that uh, I'm getting old and that's what all people do. Uh, so I hope you indulge with me. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I think you should all like, appreciate that we do really beautiful science, right? And in quantum information is really like uh, we're exploring the ultimate limits of both physics, computer science, mathematics, right, engineering, maybe philosophy, right, if you want, all at the same time, right, so it's very, I think that we can do this, and exciting. And really we're building on a lot of work, right, like 40 years of work in quantum information science, at least 100 years of work in quantum mechanics, right, by very smart people, you know, 100,000 years of both of human development, right, and 3 billion years of evolution, right, that we have our brain space, it's quite remarkable, right? And you know, our universe is like in you know, maybe for 13 billion years, we don't know for sure. And it's remarkable that we can understand this, right? So, so you know, science is really a great thing, and it's and it's we should remember that, right? So so we should of course be responsible for carrying the ball forward for future generations, right? But we should also remind ourselves daily that you know we have to be excited, we have to be wonder, we have to have fun doing science, right? And uh, and sometimes I forget that, and I, I'm sure you forget too, right? Because you get stressed, because you know you want to get a job, because you have to finish a paper. But you know it's not, and it's part of the job. But remember to be excited about what you do, right? Because it's very exciting what we do. And you know we need friends, right? For doing this, you know, to share the duty and to have fun together. And there's no better place than here, right? For you know making new friends and seeing old friends. 
So I hope you come back in the future, and I hope you remember this as you know, uh, good time in your four years of your career. So thanks, and that's it. That's all. and then similar proposal to see how it works. Um, there was some improvements in some parts, like I haven't read the paper actually yet, so I cannot tell, but there was one thing that has to be improved, which is to engineer the interaction that you need with the squeeze backstage is more complicated. So, so right now to implement the level that with the bottleneck, but this theory paper is by you know, uh, Ashler, I think Young Jiang, and some other people. Do show there is an interesting idea in this, but it has to be explored more effectively. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I got lost a, a, a few minutes ago, but how do we know that the transform and Scylla architecture is not biased, or is it? So, uh, I mean, it could be biased, right? <coughs> but it, but it, 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 it's a little bit biased, actually. So, and, uh, so, but very, very little. So, you know, and it's just a little biased, it cannot really use repetition code or write scene surface code. That's just because of the error mechanisms that you have there, right? So, uh, that it turns out there's not. Uh, and, but, but also because of the implementation of the gates. So even if it was not, you know, if it was unbiased, the CMOT gates, if you have air in the middle, is not biased as well, right? Mm -hmm. So that would already spoil the Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding uh, other structures to build quantum computers, for example, photonics through circuits and uh, they have this problem that uh, if the circuit has a long depth, the photons that go through fibers, they tend to dissipate, and that kind of creates a limit on the whole scheme. Maybe superconducting qubits have a similar <coughs> problem. Uh, can you say the problem of photons again? Uh, while photons travel through fibers, yes. They tend to dissipate. Ah, photon loss. Yeah, right. So exactly. So so you did, uh, once you use this kind of schemes with gap codes, it's very similar, right? So you have this chemistry, the microwave photon is there back and forth, and it can get lost. Whereas right? so this photon loss is the main source mechanism, right? And this you know this passive gap is exactly trying to correct uh, the effect of bit flip due to photon loss, and then use a repetition code to correct phase flip due to photon loss on this coherent state, right? So that's. That's in that sense very similar, but but you know for optics you don't want on an optical fiber, so you're going through things bouncing back and forth in a chemistry right? Thanks. So. Final question. Hi. Uh, so when we're dealing with photons and we perform measurements on a photon, we we lose the photon afterwards. Mm -hmm. So how are measurements? Perform on superconducting qubits and, and do they still exist after the measurements? Right, good question. Uh, and the, uh, you use a trend for measurements. So first, right, you, it's okay to measure in the plus minus phase. Uh, so, so basically, right, you want to measure the parents of your gap hole. You want you want to know if it's alpha plus minus alpha or alpha minus minus alpha, right? And then what you do, right? So one has an even parity of photons, the other has an odd parity of photons. You bring your transform, you apply this dispersive interaction, right? And then you know, the, the, the transform will shift, right? You have a symmetry there, so the energy will shift depending if you have even or odd areas. Then you measure the transform that you can measure, and then you get the information, right? So, and then you only measure the parents, nothing else. That's why you don't destroy the focus, right? So that's how it's done. Uh, Fernando, I, I will allow myself to make a question. It's something that, uh, so like we focus here on true to be gate, right? Yes. So, in some systems, uh, probably not the superconducting ones, but like in ions, we have native like an N-local gates mm -hmm. that can like entangle many qubits at the same time. So 
does it make sense to think in terms of like uh, doing calls for like instead of like two big gates, like and local gates? And if it does, like uh, is there any way to use Supercool that can use to, uh, to build this native uh, and local gates? Yeah, so it's um it's um I think it's similar to a question we had last time, right? So so even for the surface code, right? So uh, you can already see that you could have a a CXXXX gate, right? So you have one control and four targets. Just with these gates, you can measure in depth on the satellite, right? Because that's how you use the CMOS gates, so applying to the bridge, right? So, so like having, you know, a, a five-body gate would definitely help there. Uh, and uh, there is proposals for doing that, using, you know, caps mode, specific couple, right? So mean one channel specific couple to any caps mode, for example. So, what you have to be careful there is just propagation of errors, right? Because it is a very low local gates, you know, single error would propagate into a grade 5 error if you're not careful, right? So, and that's the error for error correction. So that's why usually, you know, like, uh, um, that, that, that's something that you have to think about in your scheme once you want non-local gates. But, but definitely in principle, it would help if you have non-local gates, both for the surface code, but also any, any sort of any topological code, right, usually involves just kind of this control x x x x or control z z z z z right where no local gate would go. So just to keep in mind, like uh, let's uh, well first let me say that unfortunately it's the last lecture of uh, Fernando. So on behalf of the organizers and other students, like we warmly uh, thank you for uh, your time and really sharing like your knowledge and experience like at the frontier really. On the edge of quantum computing, so it was truly uh, inspiring, and I'm really uh, looking forward to see what's going to come out of this work at the Amazon, and hopefully see you in Paraty next time. For so, sure, invite me. I'll be here. Yeah, thanks. So, <laughs>